it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Derek Fanchet here this evening. Obviously, uh, you know, a very, very important British artist uh, based in LA, and I'm not going to preempt his talk by uh, telling you you're here because you know who he is. Um, and Derek's going to talk, and, and uh, he was kindly introduced to us by uh, Professor Stephen Farling, the Richardine Hopkins Chair of Drawing at the University of the Arts. And Derek's going to talk, talk and uh, then we're going to show a, a short film. And then we're very, very uh, pleased this evening that we have a uh, kind of cultural commentator, Paul Gorman, here this evening, who, who uh, is very well known for, for his, his books, including The Style Bible, um, The Look, Adventures in Rock and Fashion, and, um, and also his book on Barney Bubbles. Um, Paul is currently curating a show um, on uh, Lloyd Johnson, and that show opens at Chelsea Space next Tuesday, and you're all welcome to come to that event as well. Um, so it gives me a great pleasure to introduce Derek Bochet. Um, thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to do one of those lectures in which I start right in my undergraduate student days and gradually work, work, work right through. It's like the life of just one artist. Um, I normally say to people before my lecture, please interrupt me at any time. I'm not that sort of person that you know, doesn't mind being interrupted. This time I'm going to ask you not to because I'm trying to condense this lecture, which is normally about an hour and a half into 45 minutes. Um, I say that because... Um, the, the, the lecture that I've, uh, the largest audience I've ever done a lecture to is about 600, 700 people, and it was in Budapest, in Hungary, in the Artists' Union. It was a huge theatre. And um, because I didn't speak Hungarian, I had an interpreter, of course. And uh, cognizant of that, I put a slide up and talked very slowly and interpreted. And then I put the second slide up, fine. And about 10 minutes into the slide, someone shouted from the audience, Excuse me, but the interpreter is not saying what you're saying. So that was a bit. So we sold it because I said, and they said, you know, at least half the audience speak English. So yeah, and I asked for, for you know, if there were any interpreters in the audience, and there were about four. And so we did the lecture together. Okay. Um, I, was art, I was at the art college in the 50s. I had a very, very academic training, which everyone had in the 50s. That was the academic style now then as, well, I don't know, conceptualism is a new academic style. Um, so um, we had, for instance, um, uh, we had to go into the life drawing room every single day, Monday to Friday, and in your first year, you weren't allowed to paint. You could do drawings in the life drawing room, but not allowed to paint. And you weren't allowed to paint unless you passed an exam. An exam consisting of naming every single bone in the body, and one third of the muscles. And I even today remember what I was told was the smallest muscle in the body, which is in the eye, which is the ubiquitous pulpitorum, if you'd like to look it up. So, um, wait a minute, just uh, let me get used to this quickly. I can't see. Three. Yeah, this is um, muscle that wants on that. That's it. That's up. Okay, okay fine. Um, what do I to There we go. So, with the academic training came uh, certain instructions from all faculty, which you were to always carry a sketchbook. You had to take it every single place you went. In fact, I do remember going to the movies one evening, one Saturday night, and noticing a lot of fellow students in the audience, uh, not in the audience, in the, in the line to go in, and oh, I looked around and I saw a faculty member walk past me. So I sort of crept into the wall. And the faculty member went up to the a student, about 10, 10 people in front of me, and he shouted, Where's your sketchbook? This is Saturday, Saturday night at the movies. So um, I took this, uh, I was, went to Morocco and, uh, uh, in the late 50s, and uh, I took this sketchbook with me, and this is one of the ones. Yeah. Um, I may get focused. Anyway, is it, is it, will it focus? Or maybe the slides are focused. So I went to the Royal College of Art, 
And here's David Hockney uh, and myself in the studio. And this is before, as you know, David dyed his hair, but he saw an, an ad for Claro, which said, belongs to have more fun. So um, that's where we were. Um, I must tell one teaching story, because everyone that's ever taught has got a good teaching story. And my lecture's called From Doris to Chemical Culture, a Chemical Cowboy. So I'll tell the story. I was teaching at the University of Houston in Texas, and there was a student there called Doris. She could have been David, but she was Doris. And um, she was one of those students who you talk to all the time, and she'd say, oh, yes, oh, thank, oh, thank you so much. Oh, God, that's so interesting. And she'd never do anything about it. I mean, she had this <laughs> reputation for never doing anything that the faculty said. And I, she was in my class. She was in her first year uh, when she came. I had her in my class. And then she was in uh, the last semester of her last year. And she, I was conducting a painting class. And she, I, we talked about the, the structure of the class and what we would do. And uh, she came up to me and she said, Derek, can I talk to you? And I said, of course. And she said, I've got this. I've got to tell you, she said, everything that I've learned in three years is coming together. It's, it's absolutely not. I just know I'm going to make such good work. I'm going to make such good paintings. I said, oh, great, that's fine. What's the She said, well, I told you I'm going to make good paintings, but I don't know what to paint. I said, well, that is a bit of a problem. I said, you know, and I, I, I have a longer explanation for this conversation, but basically, um, she, she said she was down to two things. And I said, oh, well, this is that's two things. Let's talk about it. She said, well, I can't decide to make paintings of geometric shapes or men with erections. <laughs> <laughs> this is a choice. Um, so that's one of my best uh, uh, teaching stories. I told her to start off with geometric shapes and walk in the men with erections. And she didn't do it. And I told my dealer that. And she said, you should do it. And I did a painting of that. <laughs> um, sometimes in an artist's career or a student's career, um, there is uh, works that you look back and they are seminal works. I did this work in 1961. You see, before I was showing you a very traditional academic work. And then this is one of the first paintings, actually it wasn't the first, it was the second or third, that, that became very important in my shift in, into popular culture and to... Um, and this was a response to the American invasion of uh, Cuba, the failed invasion by President Kennedy, uh, called the Bay of Peaks. And basically, as you see, it's the Cuban flag being eaten into by the American flag. And that became really part subject of my particular pop art paintings. Um, I, I was not a pop artist who celebrated, uh, particularly celebrated uh, popular culture uh, in the way that, uh, you know, each, each person that you might know now as British pop had different agendas. David Hockney, of course, was autobiographical. He was recording his life. And uh, Alan Jones came out of European painting. Peter Phillips and Peter Blake were celebratory. They loved pinups and, you know, that sort of thing. And, and uh, they, they were, it was a celebratory thing. Um, my own thing was uh, much more of a critique uh, of... Uh, Oh yes, this is one of the earlier paintings uh, that I started to use airmail letters uh, on the outside and I used this symbol of Pepsi-Cola many, many times. Uh, I used the, the, um, this symbol of Pepsi-Cola as a symbol of American colonization. Um, during the lecture, I'm going to, you know, I've, I've been involved in many things. I've done painting, sculpture, drawing, installation, playing movies. And, um, uh, but the thing I've always been very constant with is drawing, because I think drawing is very important. And this is drawing for uh, um, uh, one of the preliminary drawings for actually a painting that was shown quite recently in the National Portrait Gallery. It was called Pop Portraits. I did a painting called uh, Man Playing Billiards and Thinking of Other Things. And this is not directly like that, but I did a sort of series of drawings like this, and uh, it came out. You can see in the corner the idea of the pockets of a billiard table. Um, I'm talking about this focus. Can we get this up first? Which one is this one? Is, this one is, this is, this is, this is. Okay, all right. Okay, I think that might be out of focus anyway. So I, um, I'm sorry about that slide. 
slides. Um, I love better. Um, this painting um, is, is, is another thing that I based on the willow pattern. And it was also based around the nuclear thing. I was very involved in the nuclear uh, march, older march than marches at the time. So these sort of images also go along with the peacefulness of the other piece. Um, this is a painting, this is a, a painting um, in, of 1962 called Rethink Reentry. And the, the, uh, at the top is 1644, which is, is the, a date that the, <laughs> the town of New Amsterdam in America was renamed in New York. And it was the time of this intercontinental ballistic missile. So I bought a toy of that, and that's in the painting. And the figures came out because of a, a certain thing. Uh, at the Royal College of Art in 62, the faculty said, right, everyone, stop all this pop art nonsense and get down to some real work. So you've got to take a classical painting and do a transcription, not a copy, do a transcription. So we all thought, oh, I'm going to fight for this, you know. And uh, so, but we, everyone learned from it. I think uh, David Hockney did uh, the f uh, painting called Farewell to Britain, Ford Maddox Brown, the Pre-Raphaelite. Um, I can't, I, I actually, I took William Blake, and that's what I started, the first time ever I painted naked falling figures, because they were a great symbol, and what I was trying to do with, it was also incorporate vulnerability, the sort of Americanization of British culture, and also uh, advertising the power. Uh, advertisements are getting much stronger in the early 60s, very subtle. You know, just didn't have the lady drip across the car anymore. It was, ju it was just, you know, much better. There was much more analysis of what was going on. Uh, drawing again at the time, this is a drawing of a painting that's actually in the Whitworth Gallery in Manchester. Uh, but this was a drawing at the same time. I think I'm speeding on a bit. Uh, this is a drawing that's in the Tate, a uh, painting that's in the Tate, called um, The Identikit Man. Um, I came into college one day and I thought, I knew, I knew I had this blank four, four foot, a five foot square canvas, and I thought, what the hell am I going to do? And I walk, as I walked in, I noticed everywhere I was being bombarded, as I had been done in the last few days for advertisement for the first toothpaste that ever had stripes in it. <laughs> and um, I remember thinking, God, it's everywhere. So I do, you know, do something about identity with this. And that's, uh, but mostly because most of my pop art paintings came out of the reading of certain books. Vance Packard's The Hidden Persuaders, Daniel Borstein's The Image, and anything by Marshall McLuhan interested me. So that's how my own particular Pop work came about. This is a drawing in the BNA, but it's connected to that. I just say that I've always been the one that's never used traditional methods of paper. I mean, this is charcoal and, and paint on almost tracing paper. I've always tried to, uh, like in, in teaching, you know, if you've been teaching for many, many years, there's certain questions that always come up. And one of them is, I've got, this, I've got this great idea for work. And what, what, what medium shall I use? And I always say, look, the answer's simple. I don't think it's too simple. But use the medium that best suits the idea. I mean, don't make a documentary film of it if it makes a better drawing and vice versa. So, you know, think about that. So this was, I mentioned Vance Packard, The Hidden Persuaders. This is uh, uh, a, a chapter heading to one of his books. Uh, one, of, one of his books was called So Ad Men Become Depth Men. And the other thing is, I think as you go on, as you, as, as you progress as a student, but certainly as you progress as a, 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 an artist, is you realize that there are certain things that you, you did early on and you're still doing. I do a lot of morphing. Uh, I've always had morphed, uh, but I called it then, uh, what is it called? Metamorphosis. But uh, morphing is the word now. Um, when I left, uh, I was doing all this pop art, and I thought, well, I haven't travelled enough. Anyway, basically, I went to India. And lived in, I, went, I had a scholarship and went to India, and lived in India for a year, from 1962 to 1963. So, you know, I didn't sort of 
become so involved with pop art. Uh, and this is a drawing, but uh, while I was there, on the left is Hanuman, the great uh, Indian deity, god of servitude. And uh, on the right was uh, what I was reading about in newspapers in India, the space race. So it's, uh, again, it's uh, Hanuman morphing into uh, astronaut. In um, 1968, um, I was sent with... Uh, I was sent with Joe Chosen on a cultural exchange to not working. I was sent on a cultural exchange to Hungary, uh, to Budapest and uh, Prague. And when in Prague, we did this event. Uh, can I that to you to do? Sorry. I um, we did this event called the Smith Novak event. Obviously we couldn't paint and do you know, we could have done some drawings. But we did this uh, something called the Smith Novak event. And uh, Smith being the most popular name in the London telephone directory, we went to the British Embassy in Prague and Xeroxed off all the all the four or five pages of Smith's. And in Budapest, uh, in in Prague, thank you, in Prague the equivalent is Novak. So we did the Smith Novak event. And we paraded the streets for a week and got everyone involved and you know, tell them that come to this particular square at a particular time and we do this event. I don't know what it'd be called now, performance or, but we call it an event. And um, we gather people together and um, we ask everyone, we supply paper or cardboard and ask everyone to um, uh, cut out images and check magazines and um, please only send them if you, please don't take them if, unless you're going to actually send them because we ask them to send uh, the, a postcard to someone in uh, Prague, in, in London. So under here, I'm going to read this. I'm sorry to have folks again. I'm going to read this because it says, Smith, Pro, uh, Smith uh, Novak event. You have been selected by the Prague committee of the Smith Novak event to perform a friendly act to a person in Prague. Since you cannot wave or smile, we invite you to send a postcard of London to your opposite number in Prague. And of course below here was the address of a Mr. and Mrs. Novak. So all, all the Smiths in London sent Novak's postcards of London. And uh, 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 it actually worked. They had several hundred. But unfortunately this was in May. And in June, uh, in September or August that year, the Russians moved in with their tank and they crushed what was called the Velvet Revolution, Dubček. It was the Prague Spring. So this was, this was, I hope Mr. Smith sent one back. Um, I got involved in <coughs> working some sculptures and I've been actually making some sculptures lately, miniature one. Uh, and I got to the idea of trying to make sculpture without actually having sculpture. So I did a, a, a book and an installation called 16 Situations. And I'll just show you quickly the slides because it's self-explanatory. This is called Dealer's Hand. This is called Mosquito. This is called Japanese Interior. Sometimes the object changes the situation and sometimes the situation changes the object. For instance, this object is very formal. So if you take a formal, uh, formal object and you put it in a formal situation, of, of all the images in the book and in the installation, it, it belongs here, as it were. Um, this is the Whitney, uh, uh, Whitney um, Museum of Art in New York. And I'm British, so I can't officially show in the Whitney Museum of British Art. So I thought I'd put myself in. <laughs> This is, gives you an idea. This was, uh, this was actually a, um, an advertisement for Westinghouse alarm clocks. And so I took the alarm clock out and put the sculpture in. And it's not the way most people wake up to the alarm, as you'll notice. <laughs> so, uh, and that was the installation, although it did have a, a, plex, a perspex thing on it. We took it off to photograph it. Uh, in 
three, I did an installation at the uh, Whitechapel Art Gallery called Change. And it consisted of, oh, it's all about change, change, permutation. Okay. Um, it's about change, every sort of change you can think of. And no one piece of work made sense without reference to what went before or what went after. In this sense, I was very influenced by the films I've been, the movies I've been making. In fact, this is basically a storyboard for film. It's a film storyboard slowed down and taken back to stills. Um, interesting. Anyone know who that is? David Sylvester, apparently, for you art historians. Uh, just to give you an idea of what the piece was about, um, this is an article in a magazine. I took, um, uh, I was shooting, uh, at the time I was shooting 16mm film, and in 16mm film there's 14 frames, uh, 14 frames a second, per second. So I took 24 frames and took them down to stills, and then showed them, and what, uh, Basically, what happens with, uh, when you do that is you see things in stills that you can't see in a moving film. The eye can't take in the, the, the information sometimes in a moving film, but, but if you break it down to stills images. And I was making movies a lot at that time about the difference between, I was making movies about stills and moving, and move, moving, moving images and stills. I inter, inter, uh, dispose of each of them. And so that came out of that. Um, if you look, so the, 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 the stills are the confrontation between two dogs, a very large dog and a small dog. And um, then uh, it goes left, uh, the, uh, right, and uh, then you see, if you can see the top one, second, second one down in the, in the second row, is uh, I introduce a collage, and it's a dog, a Scottish terrier. And then below that, is an actual photograph of the Scottish Terrier because it's on, it's on a book called Our Friend the Scottish Terrier. It's a book on dogs. And then I turned it into a silhouette and the silhouette actually changes into uh, second from the left, a, a map of South Africa <coughs> with the word Johannesburg there. And then the map, of, uh, the map of South Africa changes back into a student being attacked by uh, a police dog in Cape Town University. So the whole thing, and the, and the whole thing goes into uh, Barnet Newman and various uh, language and stuff. But it just gives the flavour of what the police was about. Um, the only thing, was, and that's the last image. Um, again, no computer, but it was all done by hand, you know. Another hand thing. Um, I, uh, funny enough, um, I might, if you're not bored of that, but after we're doing this interview, and I'm going to show, we're going to show one movie, but I've got also a, a short 10 minute movie, because in 1973, when I showed this in the Whitechapel Gallery, um, I also made a movie of it, it's 16 millimeter, black and white, 10 minutes, and I added sound, but I didn't like it. So I put it in the film cam, and it's remained in the film cam for 38 years, until two months ago. And I opened the film cam thinking, nitrate, nothing there. Perfect film, and I just put it on DVD, and I've got it here. We might look at it later if you want. Uh, so I made lots of films, and I was very influenced by films. I, my work was very, into my, my, a lot of things I've been interested in. My paintings are influenced by films, which I'm working in the things I'm doing now. Again, always go back to drawing. Someone told me this. Um, one of the things I'm quite proud that I was involved in is the Open University when it first started. And we we opened a, we had a course called Art and Environment, and it was to do with uh, anything that was not anything that was being produced that was not being produced in museums or commercial art galleries, and we. Um, um, I, I, I set a project for the students and I said, when you come in for tomorrow, our project will be you buy a newspaper on the way. Buy a newspaper and we'll work off the newspaper. And I was thinking it could work anyway. If someone's a realist artist, they could just copy the photograph. If not, um, they could uh, 
So on the way, I bought, I bought a newspaper. I bought my favorite paper, the Daily Mail. And, uh, uh, I simply put it up, and then next to it, I did a drawing, basically. That's all I did. I did a drawing of the newspaper. And, uh, see that boy, sorry. Okay, I did a drawing. All I did was left in the adjectives. And for, for a quicker viewing, I'll read it to you. Carving knife, home to razor sharpness, metal pipe, wickedly lacerating, weaponry, bloody Saturday, authority, hate, law and order, anger, decent races, acid, knife, bludgeon, evil scar, slash, fear, panic, bleeding. You know, not that they were provoking anything. They were talking about the riots in Lewis. <laughs> not that they're provoking anything, of course. But we clean over the day now. It's a shame on you people are still reading it. Um, I did a series of, uh, uh, I taught print making at Royal College Bar, I did a series of prints. This is, um, it, it, unfortunately it's hard to read, but it's all about, it's quotes about the castle, how he was an evil communist. <laughs> and, and then at the top is the um, Times, Times newspaper, the Times ad, newspaper ad for, you could buy a um, constable plate. <laughs> and then, and then there's, a top, there's a top thing, a tennis instruction book, which, um, which is changed into an abstract painting. This is abstract painting number one, number two, number three, number four. Um, and I started to put attachments on. I have, the, I, have, I have these prints. I found them again. I, I did these prints in 72 or 73, and I just found them. And I've got about 25 left. I, I, just never, I thought that they were all wrong, which is great. Uh oh, upside down, but it's another print. Uh, uh, basically, uh, upside down view. I was asked to design a cover for Studio International, and so what I did was I, I, did, um, I did a cover which was all the different, various images of how the public see artists, you know, Kirk Douglas and Van Gogh, uh, the, the, uh, the Hogarth Laundry. And my favorite is Tootsie Roll Fudge, which is an American candy. And it's called Great Masterpieces of Our Time, Rembrandt and Tootsie Roll Fudge. <laughs> um, uh, this is a series that is ongoing. In fact, um, I've had several shows lately of, of, of a continuation of this. This is, I think this is about 78, I think. Uh, I, did, I, did a sh I have a show that does the rounds called Extreme Makeover. And basically, it takes photographs and totally changes what the photographs are about. This is, uh, you can't see it because it's off screen. It, this is cosmetic, um, this is called the Press Cosmetic Salesman. But, um, um, you know, as an artist, an, an artist who actually um, is involved, I mean, it, basically, my work is sort of socially orientated. Um, I hope not political art. I, I always like what Hans Hacker said, that great uh, um, Dutch, I think he's Dutch, he's a German, German artist that lives in New York. Hans Hacker said, make your art political, not political art. You know. <laughs> so I, I always like that kind of idea. Um, so one is involved in, you know, one's life, in my life, I was born, actually, I was actually born two years before the Second World War, so I actually remember the Second World War. And uh, my, my pedigree is that, yes, Kennedy assassination. I, I, would, I lived through the civil rights organization. I lived through feminism. So, you know, whatever you do, if you're the sort of artist that works off that, I mean, I have great respect for outside artists, don't get me wrong. But I'm, you know, personally, I couldn't do that. Um, you know, I think, uh, I don't know, one of the things I always thought is, I've always seen style as a trap. I think it was Picasso said, you know, style can be a trap for artists because it locks them into something. So, I always must be much more interested in content. Um, this was a piece called Chic, Only Some Women, Chic, Only Some Women Have It. Let's see if I can focus quite a um, Chic, Only Some Women Have It. I did a lot of anti-Vogue magazine works, and this was one too. So there's a, 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 an ad from Vogue magazine, and, and, and the, the woman is being surrounded by black and white photographs of women at work. Okay, I, I curated a show at the Hayward Gallery. This is one review. You didn't like it very much. 
Um, the catalogue is awful too. Um, I did have some, some good reviews, by the way. I did a show called Lives, L-I-V-E-S, and the, the exhibition was subtitled Arti um, Artists Who Use Other People as the Subject Matter of Their Art. So there's no abstract art, no landscape art, no performance art in which people worked off of themselves, and no self-portraits of any description. And uh, there were about 28 artists in it. Again, we can... If anyone wants to take that further, we can talk about it in the discussion afterwards. This is one piece by John Duggar, a very interesting artist. He made banners. He's a banner artist. This was a banner he made. It was commissioned to do by the Chinese government, who were trying to introduce <coughs> basketball into China. I'm going to have to speed up, I notice. I worked with the class. Joe Stommer was, uh, Joe Stommer was in my class uh, at the, when I taught the foundation course at the Central School of Art. But when he was in my course, he was called Woody. Hey, Woody. Hey, man. Call me Woody, man. Hey, man. <laughs> and uh, he used to sit in the corner of my uh, class with a wooden guitar playing Blowing in the Wind. Very oh, far. Yeah. And um, so uh, I met him uh, a little later, you know, when he was famous, uh, five or six years later. I was walking down Oxford Street about 8 o'clock in, in, in the evening. And I saw him coming. And I went up to him. And he, by this time, he had Paul Simon next to him and bass player. And, and some screaming fans behind it, because now we were dressed in black, Charles Martin's fuck, it's really right, you know. And um, so I went up to him and I said, Woody! And he froze, he said, I'm not, I'm not called Woody now. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I know you're not, Joe, I'm a great fan of the clash. <laughs> and he said, oh, great, you know, we talked a bit. And then, uh, well, less than a week later, I had another, a phone call from another ex-student called Caroline Coon. And she said, oh, you met Joe? I said, yeah. And she said, well, you know, I talked to Joe, and they said, Joe said, would you want to um, design the second songbook? Now, I have to put this in context. This was 79. 19, uh, MTV didn't come into existence in, uh, to 1981. So this is two years before MTV. Some of you probably won't believe that had it ever happened. Um, the creationist among you would uh, deny that MTV came in in 81. Um, so, um, uh, what, what, what artists did was make songbooks, uh, which was, came out of the tradition of musical, you know, uh, at the turn of the 20th century, there were penny, you know, for a penny you got the, you know, photograph the artist and you got all the lyrics and the song. So, they did, they did it. So, um, I said, that's great, you know, you know, what do I do? And, and he said, well, Joe just said, uh, 48 pages. I said, well, well, you know, do you want to give me a brief? He said, no, Joe said he was sending just a lyric and do what you like. And he said, the only thing really is I want to you somewhere on the cover, I want to have a, that nuclear sign, which is that this triangle to the top. So that this is right here. Yeah. And this is one of the pages called White Man in Hammersmith Palais. And I'm going to fast, I'm realizing I'm out of time. Uh, this, is, this is interesting. This was, this was called Judy's in a Dog Squad. Because I lived in Nottingham Gate, and at Nottingham Gate, the police were trying to cramp down on drugs. So they, they, they set up Operation Julie, and they sent out, instead of sending out women policemen, they sent out men in policemen in drag. <laughs> if you want to see them, apparently they were all saying, I too will do amazed fucking policemen down there, you know, because they could see everyone, you know, that everyone knew that they, they were the policemen in drag. Um, I also worked with David Bowie, um, uh, I, again, I've got to cut this short, but I, I worked with him, I met him, and he, you know, he said, you want to, I'm doing a new album called Lodger. Uh, if you want to talk more about this later, we might do it in interview. Uh, but basically, um, we did this. Uh, what I'll show you, so we, we can't have a million dollar rock star falling two, two stories from the floor. So, what we did, we built a table for him. Can you see there? So we built a table in which he lies flat, and the table is this shape, and his legs go out, and we shot him from above. We put the, um, you know, we put the bathroom sink on the floor and shot him from above. And I remember, he called me up, and I, he said, because uh, we used to meet a bit over a period of two or three weeks, and he, David called me up and said, look, I think we better knock this record cover on my head. I said, great. It was a Friday. I said, look, I'll have all the artwork ready by Tuesday. He said, oh, give yourself a chance. What about Thursday? <laughs> so I said, okay, fine, as long as we go what, what we said. And I said, well, wait, what, what about the inside? He said, you do what you like. So the inside is about birth and death. 
that she shaved a vera and it all tops in Bolivia. That's a dangerous thing. And there was a student in, I was teaching photography at the time, Royal College, a top right photograph is uh, a series, a guy, a, friend, a student was doing a series of about uh, mortuaries, so I included that. And this is that great uh, Antagonia painting, the death, the death of Christ, it's in Ferrigo de Milan, it's the Milan Cathedral. And this is a baby from a knitting pattern. Um, so I also worked with David quite on different things. I designed sets for him and I, I did portraits for him. And I was in New York in the summer of 1980 and uh, I had a studio and David came around and I did about um, uh, two, I think at least two, two paintings and, and some drawings and stuff. And uh, I, originally I was just going to do a head and then I decided, no, I'll, oh, I talked to David about what he was doing and he said, oh, I, I'm in the, I said, I know you're in the Elephant Man and rehearsing for the Elephant Man on stage, how is it? He said, oh, it's great, he said, but I have to stand on stage, he said, for five minutes, like, and he distorted his face and I thought, that's it, I've got to do that portrait. Because he was trying to de-glamorize himself, we're talking about that yeah. I won't go into that. But I also thought of Manny's great painting, the Pfeiffer, you know, that great uh, young boy in red trousers. Any of you still study art history? You might remember. Okay. So I went to Texas. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I went to Texas. Yeah. So um, I had a letter, and uh, uh, anyway, to cut a long story short, I, I, I was invited to go to Texas for a uh, well, first a semester, and then he wrote to me and said, would you come for a year, two semesters, eight months? And I thought, oh, that's great, you know, I've been in California, and then New York, where the hell is Texas? And I looked it up on a map, and I thought, oh, that's great, it's near Mexico, it might be interesting. So, um, I went there, and basically, uh, I thought I'd do work uh, immediately. And I was so, and I really looked at Texas culture, and I was really surprised how many people wore Stetson. I thought that was a sort of joke. But no, it, uh, it looked quite a few, and anyway, I, I did a series of paintings where you try, I tried to de-macho the cowboy, and um, which is uh, what I was trying to do here. And I did the naked cowboy, <coughs> the shy, uh, frightened cowboy, and then I did a, um, a, a, another one called the shy cowboy. I, I'll have to move on, uh, except to say I always think, oh, great! I hope this, you know, I hope some museum in uh, Texas takes this painting. This is in the Tate. I did another painting in France. Where is that? In Dallas. This one. I, when, was it when I was living in uh, Texas? I came and spent a month in uh, Paris, and I decided to do a Paris painting. Uh, so I did the Tuileries Gardens, and um, this is two figures from the Louvre. This group uh, of people from the Louvre. And then I tried to do a sort of Renoir-esque figure. I tried to contemporize a Renoir-esque Renoir figure, and so I, she's carrying a sort of plastic umbrella. And I thought, well, that'd be great. And I asked my French dealer, I said, hey, do you think we could get, you know, hopefully this stays in France. And that's in the Dallas Museum. <laughs> um, okay. No, I'll do a bit more. Okay, quickly. Um, I always like telling this story, this painting, this, this, at this uh, juncture. Um, when I went to live in America, I knew I was there for two years, I, 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 I kept my, uh, and when I knew I was going to stay longer, I thought, well, I better sell. I had a cottage in Wales. I had a, a flat in Notting Hill Gate that I owned, and I bought a, 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 a cottage. I, I used to go there for three months in the summer, and, um, uh, you know, three weeks at Christmas and I used to hang out and friends used to come and um, one day I was in my college and a guy came at, up to, he had a clipboard, he was obviously from the council and you know in the countryside and I was, I was very, I was in a very remote area I came and you know of course I asked everybody would you want a cup of tea? <coughs> so he said oh yes, he said I love a cup of tea. So he sat down and he, I went to make the cup of tea and he started to look around and he said to me, he said Don, you went up to Spino? And I said, yes, I am. I, I said, oh, he said, I, uh, I love art. He said, I love it with passion. He said, it wasn't for the mortgage and the children. I do it all the time. I said, yeah. He said, I do as much as I can. 
I said, what are you paying? Oh, she said, yes, I paint all the time, he said. I said, oh, great. He said, what do you paint? He said, what area of the paint one thing? I said, what's that? He said, what area of the paint seascapes? I said, oh, marvelous. I said, how, how many paintings do you do? He said, I do about 300 paintings a year. <laughs> I said, well, how, how many 300? He said, they're very small, about this size. Seven down the Christmas, he said. You know, we'll buy them, I said. He said, 15 quid. 15 quid, he said. He said, you know Abba Duffy? I said, yes, he said. Tourist season, he said. Gallery down there, he said. But if I could, he said. I said, oh, that's great. So you only paint the sea? Oh, no, he said. I, I said, I thought you said you only paint. He said, I do, he said, but I only paint waves eating rocks. I said, just have a quick recap here. I said, how long have you been painting? He said, nine years. So, so he's doing 300 paintings here on this side, just a wave hitting rocks. So next question, obviously. Um, why do you paint waves hitting rocks? He said, well, he said, I think company is that, that if you can paint waves hitting rocks well, you can paint anything. <laughs> Great. So anyway, then he says, like I'm doing now, oh, how embarrassing is that? I've been going on for so long. How many years? He said, what do you do? So, I'm an artist. I'm a teacher. I ought to be able to explain that. I'm not going to talk down to this guy. But, do you know what an art college is? Yes, he said, I've got two nephews in Cardiff. Good, he said, I knew nothing about art until I went to art school. Um, and then, you know, I told him, I said, and I took a book, I said, then I went this, and I did this, and then I, I was involved in pop art, and I made film, and I showed him all the stuff in books, and I did my 20 minutes, and I came to the end of it, and he said, oh, thank you so much, that was so interesting, he said, I've always wanted to do razzmatazz, he had me down to school of razzmatazz, <laughs> probably right. Um, quickly, this one, I'm sorry I'm only up to the 80s, but I, I may cut out now and uh, show you some later paintings. Let me just show this one painting. Let me show this and then one painting afterwards, and then see what I can get. Uh, okay, we're wrong way. Just a second. Uh, okay. Um, what happened here is, um, um, when I was living in uh, Texas, where I lived for 13 years, I got back to painting again. Uh, just before I went to live in painting at uh, Texas, and then I had shows in New York, and I did one of those things that we all wish for as artists. I had an absolute sellout show, and I and I uh, made a lot of money, and so I bought a plot of land and I built a huge studio. And when I built this studio, which is like you know the size of this place, I couldn't do small paintings, so I, I did these eleven and a half, uh, eleven eleven and a half, eleven foot paintings by eight foot paintings, and I started to do these epic subjects. This is called Everyday Opera, and as you'll see, um, half of this is romance, and half of this is terror, the industrial military complex. And the other, the other thing that happens is one third of this is night, and it's two third day. And I said, you know, my proposition was, that I, was I said, I wonder if I could make a painting that combined romance and terror. And one day I was doing a lecture somewhere, I can't remember now, and I, was, I described this painting as I've just tried to do, trying to deal with the idea of romance and terror. And some person from the back said, romance is always like that for me. <laughs> so I'll just show one more, just because I can move on. Oh, that's corporate business that's called. Let's see if I can. Uh, okay, let me see if there's any one. Uh, just that I you know, wanted to show some drawings. This, is, this was in the 70, late 70s or early 80s when I was, uh, I was in a friend's apartment in a loft in New York and we were watching the agony and ecstasy and we had a great collection of toys. Okay. This is called Family. This is a Texas. Yeah. Okay, I will quickly show you. I'm, I'm, I'm back in Los Angeles now, 10 years ago, and I did a series of paintings about Los Angeles. And, um, um, I did two. Uh, I did two paintings. These are about six foot tall, and they're two paintings in the Los Angeles Times. And one is Clinton acquitted, and uh, uh, next uh, I thought 
in two weeks time in two weeks time, whatever the LA Times is, I'm stuck with it, I'll do a painting. And I don't know if this is it. Oh, we missed it, it's jumped wrong. But I'll show you this quickly. Because you couldn't do you couldn't do a series about LA without transsexuals. <laughs> so uh, this is that one. I'll uh, just show you one more. Oh well, also I did the uh, um Damazel Damignon, I just changed the gender that one. No. Okay, I, I'll stop here. And yeah, yeah. I've got some. Uh, can shut that open? I'm going to show you some on, on my iPad. I've got some um, a series of paintings I'm working on now. I'm working on a series of paintings now called um, it's called Paris, France, Paris, Texas, Paris Hilton. So. Uh, and you'll see the imagery is, uh, I'm using imagery of iPads and uh, iPhone. I, I'm doing this series of iPad and I, iPhone uh, imagery, and uh, to anyone here that's American, they would, every American would know who Archie is. Um, I don't know if you know it, that there's a, a hero, uh, someone that's been about, about since the 1950s called Archie, and there's a whole series of teenage comics called Archie Comics. And Archie was this suburban, clean-cut kid. And so I did, I took the Archie comics, and I've taken all the figures out, so you only get the interiors and exteriors. And behind it, you see, is pornography. And the, um... Shall I move on? Yes, we move on. Yeah. And the painting called No Archie. Well, I'm sorry, you can't see. Well, you can see if you shift your head. Next. Yeah. Next. Uh, this was the, this was the uh, painting that I based the title of the series on. Uh, what I've been doing in the last few years is taking one painting and base, basing the whole series on that, the title of the whole series. And this, is, this painting is nothing like this now, because there's now an extra 16 or 17 falling images in this. But uh, Paris Hilton is at the top left, you can see. Uh, left, next, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, next. Uh, this is the second painting that I did. I haven't shown you the first one yet. This is the second painting. What I've done in all these, most of these paintings is put a journey in. You'll notice there's been roads going in. And I've been constantly doing that with this new series. Uh, this is called uh, It's Raining Apps and Blogs. Uh, <laughs> next. And then in it, uh, there's some autobiographical stuff. This is my falling figures and my 62 paintings and some other. Next. Yeah, another road. Next. Um, this is again taking, you know, taking the interior of the Archie comics and uh, to represent suburbia. And this is called Quiet Afternoon. Just straight here. Let's see. Next. That could be the last one. Oh, this. Um, mm. Okay. So when I started this uh, series, I, um, I've, I've now got in the habit, and I'll break it because I don't like having habits, but... Um, um, what I decided to do, the first painting I do in a new series is always a large one. This is about 10 foot by 5 foot, I think it is, uh, or something like that, 12 foot by 5 foot. And this is just the left hand side of the painting. Because, you know, painting is always <coughs> multifaceted, There's, or art, any artwork is multifaceted. So there's always more than one reason. I always set myself tasks to do within paintings, apart from the content. I also try, for instance, what I'm trying to do in those last series, I'm doing diptychs. I'm trying to put two canvases together, but I want to hide it too. So I'm trying to come up with strategies to hide the dip. But, oh, I mean, but also, just, just as an artist, I've always done, which is I, make, I try to make paintings slightly awkward. You know, if I can get them right, I like to introduce this element of slight awkwardness. There's not something not quite right about it, because that gets the audience involved. Um, so next, so this is the left-hand side. Okay, what I must tell you is this slide is complete, and it's my fault, because the person who took the photographs took it on, when, when, when they, went, they went on to uh, put the, this package together, they did it wrong. This side is over there. So basically, these two heads are not in the middle. He is over here, as a half head, and she is over there. And uh, this was the first painting, and the painting's called Pauline Goes Digital. 
for Pauline Bautier. I don't know if any of you know who Pauline Bautier is. She was one of the very few uh, female pop artists. She was an incredibly good artist. And she's getting a lot of attention now at last. She, um, she was in that marvellous, funny film called Pop Goes Easel, in which were, uh, myself, Peter Blake, Peter Phillips, and she were the subject matter of a, of a Ken Russell film called Pop Goes Easel. And it was the day in life of four British pop artists. It was made in 1961 and went out on British television in 1962. And um, unfortunately, Pauline died aged 28 four years after that was made. But she's an extraordinarily good artist, and I think, you know, any of you doing theses ought to look her up and do stuff. She's, she's amazing. And um, that's one of her paintings up there. In fact, um, the, the man in the sunglasses is um, a portrait of Jean, uh, Jean-Paul Balmondo, who wrote there, an Italian movie star. Hello. Um, well, I'm Paul Gorman. And um, we got quite matey a couple of years ago. I'm really, uh, I work in the debased uh, culture or popular culture, I guess. Um, but we got matey a couple of years ago because um, I had a project about this uh, graphic designer uh, called Barney Bubbles, who um, connected with Derek over the show, the, um, the group show Lives at the Hayward in 1979. In fact, 1979 was a big year for you when you were engaging with popular culture. It seems to me popular culture was coming to you. David Bowie, Joe Strummer, yeah. and Barney was connected to you via Marco Livingston. And can you tell us something about your work with Barney and maybe a bit more about Lives? Um, yeah, the, the Lives thing was, um, I, I don't think the Arts Council is still doing it. I think they are. They are, once every two or three years or four years, they ask an artist to actually be a curator, uh, which is what I did for a year. The show was um, planned to go to the Serpentine Gallery, but they found it too controversial, so they put in an A with I don't know what the difference is, really. Oh, oh they told me because it was a royal park. Didn't they great? So uh, um, I had this year in which I um, curated a show. And I told you what it was about. It's called Lives, and it was subtitled uh, Artists Who Used Other People as a Subject Matter of Their Art. And um, uh, I actually, it was very interesting because I was on the other side of the fence, you know, as it were. You know, we all know as artists, you know, someone comes to your studio, you don't know if they like the work or not, or, you know, or so. And, you know, and also you have to explain the work. You know, and all sorts of things that you know as an artist. But I was on the other side, and I, there were three things that I did as a curator, and that was, I'd say, you may have heard what you think this show is all about, but here it is from the horse's mouth. This is exactly what I explained what I was wanting to do. I said, the other thing is, you know, you've probably also heard that I'm a buyer this year for the Arts Council. Now, I've not got a big budget, and I, I will tell you straight away that I'm not buying I would tend to buy people that are not in collections, basically, because, you know, the budget's not that, you know. I uh, wouldn't buy a David Hockney or Kitai who were in the show. Um, so I said that, and I said, lastly, um, the last thing I said, whatever happens, could we be friends afterwards? Because I did have, you know, being an um, uh, artist myself, I was very cognizant of, you know, being very kind, you know, being, you know, and uh, I did get some feedback. I saw one artist, and I can't do names, and I'm not even telling mediums, but there was one artist that I saw the work, and I really liked this one piece, that's the only piece, so I thought, what, oh, I've got to go to the studio. And I went to the studio, and it was, God, it was terrible. I mean, that one work was just outstanding, and there was nothing like it. But I was, you know, I, I looked at all the work and spent a lot of time. But later I heard the artist say, at their approach, I could tell you he hated me, he didn't like me. He came to my fucking studio, you could tell he didn't like me. You know, you know. So that's when I adopted this thing of, you know, trying to be extra nice. I thought I was being nice. So I had to all those things. And there was a little controversy because of two works that were in the show. One by Conrad Atkinson, who'd done a piece, he'd made a print about, uh, about thalidomide. And it was because the Queen still held her shares in the Thalidomide Corp, the, pers- the, com- the, com- the, the pharmaceutical company that produced uh, the, the drug uh, that, that caused um, um, Thalidomide. 
And so he did a piece. Now it's controversial. And the other piece was an incredible piece by uh, his name then. Oh God. Oh, just a minute. Anyway, it may come to me. He, I, I saw his work. And I thought, in a group show, and I thought, oh, he's interesting. I want to go and see what he's doing. Because for me, as an artist, um, the shows I really like to go to see, what artists I like to see, is when I don't know what I'm going to expect. You know, I'm, I'm a very interesting artist that's going to surprise me. You know, I mean, that's why I'm not so interested in style myself, because I know it's going to be the same. Um, so I, Tony Rickaby, Tony Rickaby. Very interesting artist. So I saw, by coincidence, that he was having a show. And it was just around the corner from where I was teaching at the Central School of Art. And it was near the British Library. So at lunchtime, I went round to see the show. And I went down to the, the galleries in the basement. And I went in. And I thought, shit, that's the wrong, it's the wrong show. This can't be Tony Rickaby. Because there's a wall of etchings, a wall of watercolors, and a wall of drawings. Little drawings, and I thought, he's not. And I thought, well, I'm here, I'll look. And I started to look at these things. And the exhibition was called Fashards. So it's fascism and facades. The fronts of buildings, facades and fascism. And what he did, he'd taken the top 30 most right-wing organizations in Britain the, the, the most to the left was the Conservative Party, but everything before, like, you know, whites only, you know, everything else before. And what he'd simply done, he'd read it, all their manifestos, and he'd gone to each of their headquarters, and he did a watercolor or an etching of the building. And then underneath it, just wrote a little text, there was a text of their, whatever they were, their manifesto. So I put that piece in the show. And it caused a lot of controversy because um, there was even uh, questions in the House of Commons they wanted to take it down. But which is, it reminds me of the story. It's nothing to do with what I was saying in, except one way. And that is that, you know, you, you know, if you ask the person in the street and you, know, you show the reproductions, who's the most popular artist in the world? You know, Rembrandt, Van Gogh, or Monet, right? They're good. So it should be. When Monet, paint, when Monet painted those paintings, they actually, there's, there's a documentation of people standing in front of the painting, someone saying, what do you see? You know, famously, everyone said, well, this is not painting, someone's thrown paint at the canvas. And, then, and they could see, and they said, well, can you work, tell us what's in the picture? And they said, there's nothing in the picture. They said, is it, where's an image? There's no image. Where's the people? There's no people. Nowadays, you show, so someone did this, show people the Monet painting. They say, you're joking, you know, there's, there's a river, and there's a white cottage there, and there's a towpath here, and there's cypress trees here, you know. Yeah. Now at that time, there was questions in the house, in what's the French equivalent of house? Oh, okay. They, there were questions in the house, and they, the question in the house was, should, should we deport Monet, because Monet is a disgrace to France. And there's a motion, actual, actual motion, to um, deport him, because he was a disgrace to France. Poor baby. <laughs> 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 um, when we had uh, egg beans and toast, when well, you had, I had toast, you know, in that greasy spoon in Camden Town the other day, we yeah. were talking about the P word and whether we mentioned it, but you have mentioned pop art. Yes. Um, and uh, are forever saddled with it. But you were saying that you're a populist. That's the P word that you yeah. uh, you prefer. Yeah. And it seems to me that, and you you really describe the difference between you and the other people who are grouped under that heading at the time. Your thing is really about engaging in contemporary events and culture, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, That's I've always I've been criticised by that for being a populist, not 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 enough an elitist. But I'd always aimed my work at being, um, you know. Hopefully, um, you know, accessible and interesting to <clears throat> intellectual audiences, you know, that might be within the art world, but always so as it had possibilities of access to, you know, a person in the street, basically, in some way, if they want to engage. Uh, um, you know, I, um, I did, um, I showed you an installation called um, 
change. But I I done another I done two or three of those installations. I done I did one to cut a long story short, I was asked to do a show in Israel and um, they said if, if you're not Jewish and you've never been to Israel, we'd like you to come and I went to Israel and um, they, the museum said pick which gallery space you want and I finally chose the smallest space it was and I did a project, an installation that looked a bit like change which was called Journey Israel Project and basically it was about Israel and Jewish culture and um, I looked at it and did various things and um, what was interesting to me about, I worked on it, researched it and you know, it's all about, there is, yes there is a bit about the Holocaust in, but there's no naked bodies, but it's about the Holocaust. It's about the uh, conversion of the desert into agricultural land, it's about Jewish humor, it's about religion, uh, there's a lot of aspects in it that, um, that I worked on and um, <clears throat> just about six months or nine months before, actually probably, uh, the exhibition was due to open in the museum and they called me up and they said, look Derek, we want to run something past you and if you don't like it, just forget it. But as a museum, we started a new project and that is that we're trying to get museum shows that we curate into non-museum and non-commercial space, no non-commercial galleries. So art centers or community centers basically. And I said, perfect. So I showed this first, before I showed it in the museum, I showed it at a place in Israel called Havak Aviva. Havak Aviva. Anyway, it was, a, it was a great place. It was like a university campus. Havak Aviva. I mean, someone may have known it up there, Havak Aviva. Anyway, uh, it was like a university campus, and then it had, um, it had uh, uh, there was a language school where Jews learn Hebrew, and Arabs learned uh, um, uh, the other way around. Uh, yeah, Jews learned um, um, Arabic, Arabic and, and Arabs le uh, learned Hebrew. There was a Holocaust um, uh, archive um, museum there. There was a disco uh, for young people where Jews and, and Arabs mixed together and had discos and parties and events. Um, there was um, well, not and there's many things, but there was also a very small. And there was a music area, and there was a very small um, uh, uh, area uh, that dealt with art. There was a little art museum, and uh, they asked, I showed in that, and it was great. I mean, it was it's, it's the sort of thing I'm interested in. Although I'd never done a mural in my life, I've been trying to do a mural for 30 years. I can't get a mural. Are you going to mural? The mural. <laughs> You're yeah, sorry. You're, um, I'm talking too much. So. No, no, you're, um, the, the preoccupation with contemporary events and engagement with it is that one of the reasons you're in America? Because you know America is the kind of fulcrum of it. the events there. Decide whether we like it or not. What's going on in the rest of the world? So is that one of the attractions to residing in America? No, not really. I'm, I was married. And there was now I had two children. They lived there, but also. You know, I would actually come back to live in Britain, but I can't afford it. I mean, basically, I mean, I, I, you know, I can't, I have a standard living there, which I could never have here. Um, for instance, you know, all my friends that I was at art school with in the 60s, they all bought houses, and now they're worth two to three million. You know, I mean, I mean, I couldn't come, I, you know, I could hardly get an apartment here, selling my house. I have a house in LA, but I wouldn't, you know, so. But there's also other reasons, just I love the warm climate. And Los Angeles particularly, it's an easy way of life, you know. I mean, New York is much more like London. But, but you were saying that, you know, quite often on the social circuit at dinner parties, your work will cause, you know, discontent on your fellow diners who will be uh, oh, yeah. criticised for yeah. some of your uh, uh, bush knocking and... Oh yeah, I've had that, yeah. But <coughs> well, there's also things that you, that, you know, I mean, I, I often, you know, I miss the country. I mean, I miss sidewalks, pavements, I miss... You know, I miss friends, and I miss British humour. And uh, for instance, I, I I had a show in a museum in Houston, in Texas, and uh, there were about two or three trustees. I mean, there were several trustees that came to the museum opening, amongst which were three um, like myself, older people, and um, they came. And I happened to be standing with a very good English friend, who's an art critic who lives in Houston, David Brown. 
and another English artist who was visiting, there's three, three English people who were chatting together, and the museum curator said, oh, I want you to introduce you to Mrs. Samson, she's a trustee, and they're all trustees. And I said, oh yeah, she said, you like it here in America? I said, oh yeah, I've just come to check out that you didn't make a big mistake with it. You know, the, you know the taking over. I think maybe George the First should still be. <gasps> they walked away. <laughs> they were terrible. At it. I mean, it's the thing that in British culture you could do. You know, I have to explain to American friends that if I say to you, "What a fucking terrible waistcoat," <laughs> I mean, that means you're, you're, it's an it's interesting waistcoat. You know, it's not. I don't mean I hate your waistcoat. It's the opposite. You know. So I and I get into those sort of traps. <laughs> But so it's also with David Bowie, for instance. I mean, I, I, and he, what I haven't told you about David Bowie is that he's actually become my best collector. He has nine works of mine over the years. And um, what I haven't told you about him is that um, uh, I could tell a couple of Bowie stories if I get a request. Um, um, one is, uh, well, one thing about David is, um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, the, the, when I was talking to, uh, one day I was, I was he flew me out to New York and I was with him and um, um, uh, uh, his, his PR you know, left us alone and afterwards he said, you know Derek, she said, when you and David talk, you both change, I don't understand what you're talking about. And he said, you, you do this British speak it's, and it's totally different, which, which is true. I can tell you one David Bowie story, which is, I was with David once and we were sitting down I remember there was a big glass mirror with these electric light bulbs all around. <laughs> we were chatting, and there's two things you must know about David, um, for anyone that doesn't know him. In, the, in real life, he's very quiet, he talks quietly, I think, I think he doesn't, but, and he moves slowly, he's a, he's a slow walker, which is very strange when he's, you know, what, what he's like on stage, you know, it's, it's very different. So I was sitting down talking to David, and, um, Someone came along and said, oh, David, um, you know, um, Parry Match, you said, to, you know, the photographer's here and wants to do the thing. And David said, oh, yes. Yeah, I said, that's right, yeah, he said. So we've been talking for 45 minutes, so I got up and, you know, stretched myself, and I followed him, and the photographer was over where that, um, well, say you're a photographer. So David walked over the photographer, and he says, you know, he said, uh, he walked out and he said to me, he said, can we all set the bell? He said, yeah. He said, you want to start now? He said, yeah. He said, okay. <laughs> 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 he has that amazing thing. And, and also, you know, you know, I'm a great fan of Bowie because of his personality, apart from his music. Um, you know, he goes around to art colleges, you know, to do to, to degree shows, he'd sometimes dress himself up, but he's, he, he, has, uh, he has less trouble here in England about people bothering him than he does. I was with him in, I'll tell you what they did in Paris, but um, for instance, um, he went to one art college show, I always thought it was Chelsea, but I may got it wrong, but he went to a graduate show somewhere here in London, and he was looking at the work, a graduate, someone's graduating, and he said, oh, I like this, there's a photographer. I like this guy. He said, What's his name? He said, Take his contact number. So his PR took his contact number. And about less than two weeks later, he had a, he was, I'm told this story, that he was there and he said, um, Oh, David, uh, by the way, he said, uh, We just had this letter from um, Italian Vogue and they said they wanted to interview you. What do you think? And David thought, he said, yeah, tell them I'll do it. In one condition, he said, I want them to use that photographer that's at the college. <laughs> and this guy, two weeks out of college, his first job is to photograph David Bowie. <laughs> 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 not bad. And he's done that. He's done, like he's, he's done it. I mean, he's done it to a lot of people. He's done it for me. Someone called me up and said, oh, by the way, um, you see Village Voice? And I said, well, I, I don't get Village Voice. I mean, if I'm in New York, I'll maybe pick up a copy and look at it. He said, oh, you're, you're mentioned in it. I said, oh, really? He said, yeah, there's a huge article by David Bowie. And I, and I said, what? He said, well, there's nothing. Just just right at the end, and there's nothing to do with the interview at all. Right at the end, he said, and I think Derek Bowser was right when he said, 
and he coached me, you know. And he's done a lot. He's just coached, you know, people he, you know, used, basically uses power and fame, you know, in a very nice way. Didn't you say that he was fascinated by the falling man before you met? That was one of the things that led him to you. Yeah, um, you know, I had this, uh, uh, yeah, I, you know, he made the man who got to earth, wrote, uh, uh, Nick Rowe. And I, um, David and I also had something else in common then, as we both studied mine. Uh, you wouldn't have thought so, but right? <laughs> <laughs> So, um, and I, I actually, there was a, a, a great tradition at the Royal College of Art uh, in our years, uh, Hockney and Alan Jones here and stuff, Peter, uh, was that um, uh, we used to, we, every Christmas we used to put on reviews. And we did that because we, we were sort of paralleling the uh, Peter Cook, Dudley Moore, Alan Bennett uh, thing where they did political reviews, so we did them. I, I, I wrote stuff for the reviews, but I also acted in them. I actually wrote a conversation between Errol Flynn and Beethoven, I remember. You know, Are you sure you're deaf? Why are you? And Beethoven would say, well, what about you in Hollywood? You know, is that true? You know? So that was, we had we did a lot of things, but we also did mine. There was a guy called Roddy Moore Roxby, a very good. He was a student, an ex-student. He was an actor as well as an artist, and he taught us all mine. One day after the, uh, the the reason we did theatre, by the way, is it, am I diverting? No, no, no. <laughs> uh, the reason we did um, theatre was because there was a tradition at the Royal College of Art at that time that if you were in a painting school and you wanted a part-time job, you'd work as a stagehand at the Royal Court Theatre. So we all did to work there, I worked there, a lot of people all there. I used to take people's jobs, because I used to work, I saw, I don't know, I saw uh, Waiting for God, or Crap's Last Tape, and uh, Endgame, I'd seen all of those five or six times. I used to take people's jobs and, you know, do, and I, that's how I really got into Samuel Beckett. Um, uh, so that's how the reviews, and all the actors and directors at, at Royal Court used to come to our reviews and boo and cheer, you know, they were a very good audience. And um, so that's how, in fact, that's, uh, that's how, you know, one of the first times that David Hockney came out of the closet was when uh, a friend, a friend, an American friend called Mark Berger managed to persuade him to go on stage because he wouldn't. And David went on stage wearing a frock plus a pair of clogs. You know that we always think of clogs as being Dutch, but of course Yorkshire have a, and have a tradition of wearing columba, uh, you know, uh, uh, clogs. And we got, David went on stage in drag and he sang a song from Oklahoma. But he changed the words, I'm just a boy who can't say no. So, <laughs> so that was good. So we can drift it a bit, sorry. No, we're going we to see real, aren't we? We're yeah. What's real, which... Um, as you were saying that the rediscovery of change as well has kind of re-engaged you with film. You're now thinking about film again. Yeah, I'm just, just going to point out, David Bowie is in real, isn't he? There's a still of him at one point. Yes, there is, because it's a contrast between... It's, a ra it's the sort of thing about racism. It's about white and black. It's, you know, it's, it's, the, the, the whole film is about contrast. It's about different things in different situations. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions for Terry? No. Yes. What did you think, Derek, when you saw the film again after so long, having... Uh, no, that was not the one I'd seen after. I mean, I'll show it in a minute if you're still willing, uh, with, with his ten minutes. But um, the, uh, the film the film you, you're talking about is the installation at the White Hill. I liked it. Uh, and uh, what, what it's made me do is I'm going to make more movies. <laughs> I'm going to make some movies again. And I'm going to make them more like... You know, to take on the formats that I've done there, i.e. I want to film more stills in interacting with um, um, live action. I'd like to explore that a little more. Um, uh, I, I, I did start another film um, about five years ago and it was all to do with images on television and um, but I abandoned it but I might take that up again now so who knows yes you talked earlier on at the beginning of your presentation 
about conceptualism. You, you, you described your first work as being influenced by the academicism of the time. Yeah. And then you talked about today's academicism being conceptualism. Yeah. Can you, do you think it's the same sort of um, academicism? Uh, do you think there was any value in what you experienced when you were at college? And do you have any sense of how today's version of academicism might be different and have a different kind of uh, outcome? No, I mean, I use the word academicism, academicism in the same sense that whatever you're fed with uh, at our college now is the new academic thing. And, uh, you know, my thing, the, the, the interesting thing about, um, the interesting thing about that is that I often tell my students that um, when I was at when we were at art college, we used to get all the latest magazines, read them intensely. We used to go out to the library, read every single magazine, and then we used to chuck them in a bin because that's what we knew we didn't want to do. That's how pop art came about. And I tell my students to do it now for fuck's sake, do fucking do what? Bloody magazines and the galleries, I mean, doing, you know, your artist, being, you know, I'll do it. I know, I, I say do it if you really can take it further. There's no, you know, but academism is, is, is only what's being, you know, fed to students, you know. I think, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to move on. I mean, some generation is going to change it again, you know. Uh, uh, I, 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 and, and by the way, um, I think it's very good that, that there's, a, there's a conceptual uh, uh, academic line going on. As long as the students take it on and learn from it and move on. I mean, I'm, I'm indebted to the fact that I had an academic training in the areas that I have, as I probably wouldn't have been a figurative artist. As I said earlier, you know, I had to learn one third of the muscles in the body. I mean, and, uh, you know, I studied a, a, anatomy. You know, I, that's the way I, I, I can draw, you know. And um, I would say <coughs> to students, you know, you know, get into conceptualism, fine. But don't, find, don't just do it. I mean, if you really believe in it, that's fine. But take it further. I mean, it's not, you know, don't let anything become a religion. You know, I don't think. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I like conceptual art myself. I mean, I love could you just say something briefly about the editing process for the film? I mean, was there lots of film that was you know, left on the floor? Or okay. How, how long good, did it it's take? It's a good question. I'll tell you what happened. So, I, the reason I got into film is that I was reading an art magazine and it said, grants for artists to make films. <laughs> Preference giving not to filmmakers. The Arts Council, the Arts Council wanted to uh, encourage uh, non-filmmakers, fine artists at that time, to make movies, to explore. And I thought, that's great, because I was doing a lecture at the time, with slides, um, that I always thought, God, this would make a better movie, and I didn't have the money and stuff. So I applied, and luckily I was lucky enough to one of two people who got the grant. There was a day, a, a, guy called David Hall, a very good artist, he did a film called Vertical, and he, uh, it was all to do with the way you had the camera, it's a very good film, David Hall. And so we got to Grant, and um, so I, I got this money, and I couldn't believe it, how much money it was, I thought, oh, God, this, what, I could buy a house for this, I couldn't, but I mean, I, it seemed to me a lot of money as, um, as, a, as a young artist. Um, and so they said, you know, I had meetings with the Arts Council and they said, you know, the, you, what you'll have to do, you go down to the British Film Institute editing room, which is in, in that time was in the cut uh, down by Waterloo Station, and you go and see this guy, and he's going to look after you. So I went to see this guy, he was behind the desk, and he said, well, he said, I read your proposal, he said, you'll be here working on the film. He said, but do you tell me in your own words what the film's about. I said, well, mm -hmm. Explain the film. He said, oh, that's good. Yeah, tell me a bit more. And I said, well, I don't know. I changed my mind. Maybe I'll do this. He said, oh. he said, I'll tell you what, it's lunchtime. He said, 
He said, you go down there. He said, there's the market down there. He said, go down there and you buy four plain packs of post uh, postcards, four, four packets of plain postcards. He said, what do you say the name of the film was? I said, it's called Leak. He said, what, what did you say you wanted to start it with? I said, the, and I said, the washing machine. Or the he said, well, put that in. And he said, if you can't find words for it, do a drawing. And if you can't find a, a visual for it, write about it. Of course, what he was telling me to do was make a storyboard. I had no idea what a storyboard was for a film. And he was telling me to do that. And then he said to me, well, have you got a camera? And I said, no, I ain't got a camera. And he said, well, we're going to need a camera. And I said, well, I know, but I've got this friend that I teach with at the Central School. And He's a painter, but he said he wants, he's just bought, him and his friend have just bought a hand-cranked Bolex, 60 millimeter hand crank, you know. So you film for, you know, 20 minutes, stop filming, wind up again. And he said, good, and he said, fine. So he said, he's going to help me, and he's going to do it. And he said, what do you know about, what do you know about editing? And I said, no, no, he said, come this way, this is the editing room. And at that time, of course, it was pre-digital and everything was on reel to reel and you know, you'd know, look it up on the screen and you'd cut it up and you'd glue it on and you'd make cuts and stuff. And I learned to edit. I loved editing. I loved doing it. And that's why. Well, this person that taught me everything was a great guy. I, he became a very good personal friend. He, um, you know, I knew his family. I used to go and see him at Christmas and everything. I really lucked out because you know who this person was? Bruce Beresford. Do you know who Bruce Beresford, the Australian filmmaker? Uh, he did lots of great uh, independent movies, but his most famous Hollywood movie was Driving Miss Daisy. He did Driving Miss Daisy. But he was such, you know, he was so helpful and so kind to me. And that's how I learned everything, by just doing it, you know. So, you know. Uh, specifically about editing, I can't remember. Oh, I can tell you something about editing, but it's less to do with editing the visuals, because I had this idea, you know, foolishly, and I changed my mind when I was making a movie, that I had this idea that, um, well, I'll make a film, and then I'll just put sound on it, you know. And so when I went to talk to Bruce about the sound, he said, you know, you know their sound libraries. I said, what do you mean? He said, you know, book libraries, and they have libraries of sound. I said, okay. So I went along, and I had a particular thing I wanted to do to start the film. I knew I wanted to start the film. I just had these ideas that I thought I knew about sound. God, I love sound. I learned so much. And the sound libraries, they they loved me because I was such an idiot, you know. They could experiment, you know, they could try everything out on me. Like for instance, there is one um, okay, this is the most extreme version. There's one section of the film in which I filmed the Kaaba at Mecca. You know, the black um, draped um, cube that um, Muslims have to circumnavigate, uh, hopefully, they have to go to Mecca and circumnavigate in, uh, I don't know how many times in their lifetime. But I wanted to include that in it. And because I went to the Saudi Arabian embassy and got the film, I certainly didn't want the commentary, which was all about the oil business, and you know, to make the uh, to make a film sexier about the oil business, they introduced various Marvel's cultural things, and then they had music and stuff. But that, I couldn't have that because I wanted to have my own sound. So I got the film and took all the sound off. So I needed sound. So I needed the sound of what was it, you know? 4,000 people circumnavigating in a square. So I went to the sound library and I said, yeah, uh, what I want is, uh, you know, just, uh, they looked at it, Carver and Mecca, I said, you know, about four to 6,000 people. We tried everything. It didn't work, it just wasn't that, you know. Like, they said, well, we can scramble it. This is where they thought, oh, we can work with him, you know. Because we, you can change sound a lot. So he said, well, let's try it. He said, let's try a French market. So I said, okay, let's try a French market. But it was all, oh, you know, it was French, you know. <laughs> you know, Japan, Japanese was Japanese sound in Japan. Oh, wow. You know, was, everything was different. It didn't work. So they said, well, let's mix it together. And they mixed Japanese, German, everything together. And that was getting better. But they took this to extreme. I'd been working there a little time when this was happening. 
because I've been a fairly constant visitor to the Zao Library by this time, so we were having fun. And I, we did this on purpose. We tried to get the most extreme sound to fit into this. And you won't believe, if you ever saw the film, um, it, it really sounds like 6,000 people, 4,000, 6,000 people. But we started off with the private bar in a pub in Guildford on a Sunday. And it starts off with someone saying, Hey Jack, what are we going to have? Milton, what are we going to have? What are the whiskey? Oh, we'll go down another one. And they went, so they took this and we scrambled it. And we took some French and uh, it, it's just, it was amazing. If, if you saw it, it, you know, you wouldn't know it, but it started at such humble beginning, isn't that? But they loved it to, to work here on this thing. Uh, another thing that I did was, I knew at the start, of, right at the start of the film, I had it in my mind that I wanted the pumping sound of a, um, a dam. I don't know why I must have seen it in the film or heard it in the film. No, a and we tried, we got, we, we tried 10 dams all over the world, and it just wasn't any good. And finally, with a lot of alteration, we, launched, we used a laundromat, a laundromat sound, a washing machine going around. So, and my, it worked. Yeah, I think so. You know, have to see it. I'll have a pretty, so, uh, Are there any, um, yeah. Um, you said that your work was, um, a celebra was not a celebration of culture. Um, in the same way that other pop artists were at the time. Um, do you think there's a the utopian or a dystopian element to your work? And how do you think that modern technologies are shaping your or transforming your work? Now? Um, yeah, you know, don't get me wrong, because I think parts of my work are celebratory. You know, I like the, uh, you know, I, I picked on, for instance, I picked on the only, uh, and the best one, I'll try to answer it very directly, but the best way I can answer that is I only now own one pop art painting. You know, I gave some away. And, you know, my first pop art painting I sold, which was landed up recently in the Russian embassy, a uh, British embassy in Moscow, I sold for sixty quid, right? six foot by. You know, um, but um, the only painting I own of, from that pop period is the one that I've got a Swan Vesta matchbox. I mean, I know people don't use matchboxes anymore, but it's a, it was a beautiful. Uh, design and in that way I was so celebrating the design. It has a, it's green and red and it has a swan on it. Um, in that way I did look at products, you know, to, uh, you know, actual products I wanted to use. I mean, I used, you know, the, you know, um, the, the toothpaste. And, and, and so in that sense I was, um, you know, because I was working off, which I hope I've always done, whatever the culture is at the time, um, I've used artifacts. You know, I mean, artists and writers make art at the time that certain films are shown. We wear, we, we make art at the time of certain, we wear certain clothes, you know. We work at the time where certain things are being written and certain tele. I mean, we, we are part of our times. Even though we're an abstract painter, you know, I'm sure that a lot of abstract, I know, well, I know a lot of abstract, totally abstract painters are, Influenced by, you know, the colours of everything, and apart from the sunset, by a package of, you know, commercial food package. I'm sure. Well, I know because I talked to 